Pro-abortion advocates are furious, and they are holding a rage fest this weekend all across America. They call it the Women's March. I call it a collective freakout session. You're listening to Activist Radio, The Mark Harrington Show, and you can support the program and the work of Created Equal by going to the MarkHarringtonShow.com. That's MarkHarringtonShow.com. Well, we're going to be talking about the collective freakout of the pro-abortion advocates all across America who at this moment in Washington, D.C. and across America and other cities are holding what they call the Women's March. Now, just to give a little background here, in 2017, yours truly led a group of people from Created Equal to the original inaugural Women's March on the uh, on the mall in Washington, D.C. after the inauguration of Donald Trump. There were half a million pro-abortion advocates on the mall, and then there was Created Equal. And we were there pretty much the only opposition group to the Women's March. So, now it's been almost four years, and they have had these marches every year uh, around this time. And this is the uh, fourth uh, women's march, and they're having them all across America. And the reason why they're doing it now is because of the passage and the uh, enforcement of the heartbeat bill in Texas and the forthcoming U.S. Supreme Court, which is Dobbs versus Jackson's Jackson Women's Health Organization, which will be heard on December 1st. So this is why the pro-abortion advocates are rallying across America. And so what I want to do today, I'm going to be talking about this Women's March. I'm going to be talking about what it means, what they stand for, and why they're doing what they're doing. And then I want to take some time to kind of debunk some of the common arguments that they've used now for almost 50 years to justify abortion. So, like I said before, this is the fourth annual Women's March. I expect it to be a pretty pretty big event in Washington and across America because uh, they're like a, an animal that's caught in a trap that doesn't know what to do, right? Or an animal that's caught in a corner and will do anything it can to get free. They know their time is short. They know that Roe v. Wade has the potential of being dismantled, if not entirely overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. They're seeing what's happening in Texas, and they know the writings on the wall, that it's coming to their states. And so this is why they're reacting the way they are uh, and holding these events in Washington and across America. Uh, There are several of them. And in fact, I think there's over 100 of them right now across America. We'll be at as many as we can. And yours truly will be in Washington, D.C. this weekend to be part of some prayer events leading up to the uh, the opening of the U.S. Supreme Court. I'll be working with other organizations holding prayer events at the U.S. Supreme Court on Saturday, Sunday and Monday. And then on Monday is the Women's March. And in Washington, D.C., it's very interesting. If you look at the map, they're starting at the Freedom Plaza. They're going to march down Pennsylvania to Constitution Avenue all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And interesting enough, interestingly enough, they are going to end up at the U.S. Supreme Court at 2 o'clock. Well, guess what else is happening at 2 o'clock? That's when me and others... Uh, Some 36 organizations, pro-life organizations, will be holding a prayer vigil at the U.S. Supreme Court. So it ought to be pretty interesting, folks. Uh, Be in prayer for us because uh, we'll be going right into the lion's den with the Women's March in Washington, Washington, D.C. You know, juxtapose these two uh, events. You have the Women's March which is about the wholesale slaughter of unborn babies, no limitations, no apology. And then you have the pro-life Christian prayer event, which is a solemn event before the U.S. Supreme Court, praying for our justices, praying for justice, and praying for the upcoming case Dobbs v. Jackson. So you couldn't have a more stark contrast between the darkness 
and evil represented by the Women's March and the light, that is the light of Jesus Christ represented by the pro-life movement at the U.S. Supreme Court. So it ought to be an interesting time. And, you know, I have a lot of experience with this, I guess you could say almost unfortunately, in dealing with people like this. In fact, I would say ever since the uh, since Donald Trump became president, then leading up to last year's election, uh, then the riots all last summer, we are seeing a spike in violence towards us, towards our group, towards our equipment, and even us individually. This week alone, on every campus that we've displayed abortion victim photography, we've been attacked. Our equipment and signs have been vandalized. Just yesterday, we had an incident out front of a high school. We're going to be talking more about that in days to come. And it just seems like there's no limitations now to the radical left. And they know they're losing it. The left is losing it. Literally, they're losing the battle over life and they're losing it collectively and able to con- in their inability to contain themselves uh, with what's going on. So that's why I call it a collective rage fest. That's what's really happening in the Women's March. Now, if you look at the Women's March itself, and it's been a while since I've done a kind of an expose of this organization, like I say, it kind of arose uh, out of nowhere in 2017 in response to the inauguration of Donald Trump. But it really is just a Marxist organization. Uh, If you look at their principles, they stand for everything that's against God and Christ. I mean, period. That's who they are. Uh, There's nothing just about the Women's March. One of the, some of the interesting um, phrases that they use on the website uh, are, you know, euphemisms. Uh, some of them new. Uh, one of them is this. They, they talk and call for what they say is abortion justice. Abortion justice. Now, think about that. We've had a lot of iterations uh, by uh, by the other side on what abortion is. We've heard reproductive choice. We've heard the right to choose, the freedom to choose. We've even heard reproductive freedom. But this is a new one uh, they've been using recently. And they call it abortion justice. Now, I don't know about you, but that to me is like an oxymoron that I've never heard before. Abortion justice. Think about that. Abortion is the dismembering, decapitation, and disemboweling of an early human being. Justice, as we all know, is holding people accountable, uh, the government levying penalties against individuals, punishing them for what they've done. These two things don't go together, folks. If there's going to be a justice, it's justice for the unborn. They deserve justice. Abortion is an injustice. So those two things don't go together. But when did uh, language ever matter anymore? We, we've, we've basically made up new words. And the battle in our fight here is really over definitions. So it's important that we come against this oxymoron called abortion justice and explain how abortion is an injustice, therefore it can't go along with the word justice. In fact, we need unborn justice, not abortion justice. They also talk about the movement being a women's led movement. I find this interesting because they are for the LGBTQIA movement, a revolution you might say, the moral revolution, the sexual revolution, And it's rare that you would find them using terms like men and women, but they call it the Women's March. They say it's a women's led movement, yet they stand for LGBTQIA rights. Uh, Those seem to not go together for me. Uh, They're being awful binary when they refer to it as a women's led movement, but stay or or stand for LGBTQIA rights. You can't have it both ways, Women's March. You can't have it both ways. In fact, you you might want to think about changing that name, Women's March, because that's very binary. 
They also say they declare that they are in support of the LGBTQIA revolution. And they say that those rights, the LGBTQIA rights, are human rights, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, queer, intersex, and asexual. Now, they keep adding uh, letters to this acronym as time goes on. But like I said before, you can't be for LGBTQIA and be for women's rights because in your nomenclature, there is no such thing as a woman. Finally, they use the term reproductive freedom. And we all know what that really means. That means the ability to have sex with anyone for any reason, anytime you want. We're just like barnyard anim animals. You know, we just can't restrain ourselves. We, have, we don't have the ability to hold back. We've, we've got to be able to have sex with anybody we want when we want it with no limitations. That's really what reproductive freedom is all about in their minds. So the Women's March will be happening uh, this Saturday. And you know, many people listening to the sound of my voice will be happening as I'm speaking right now. But for those of you watching on, uh, on, on Facebook or YouTube or listening to this on my podcast, this is happening December 1st. And uh, uh, that will be in Washington and other places across the country. And if you're listening to the sound of my voice and it's before Saturday, you can come out and counter protest this event. Many groups are. Created Equal, of course, is going to be one of them. And folks, I want you to take action today. There's a couple of things you can do. The first is subscribe to The Mark Harrington Show. You can do that by going to my Facebook page and liking the program. And if you would, you can like it and you can share it and let us know what you think by leaving a comment in the comment section below the post. You can also subscribe to my podcast and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or any one of the popular podcasting platforms that are out there. Uh, if you would, that helps get the program out in front of more people and uh, so I would ask you to do that. Also, we at Created Equal and I personally, Mark Harrington, are available to come and speak to your group, to your church, uh, to your small group or prayer group, to your Wednesday night or Sunday morning service. And you can find out more by going to createdequal.org. Uh, there's an invite a speaker tab there that you can click on and find out more about the topics that we, uh, we present at these different kinds of venues. I, for one, speak commonly from the Word of God. I can present a sermon. I often speak about the uh, good parable, uh, good, good Samaritan parable, uh, and, and relate that to contemporary, the in contemporary injustice of abortion. We also have a more uh, kind of a more of a training focus in what we call Preborn Defenders 101, which would take you through kind of the uh, nuts and bolts of how to defend the pro-life position using uh, philosophical, legal, constitutional, scientific, and biological arguments to defend the preborn. And then more on a, an, a, an additional apologetics platform, we talk about the battle of ideas. So any one of these topics we can bring to your church, to your high school, uh, and to your small group or your own pro-life organization. We often speak at uh, pr pregnancy resource uh, center banquets and right to life chapter banquets. So if you're interested, look us up, go to createdequal.org. You'll find us there. Just click on the invite a speaker tab. Now, let's move on. So the the Women's March, like I say, we were part of that in 2017. It was the inaugural Women's March on the uh, on the Mall in Washington, D.C. I had never seen that many people on the Mall in all my years, and I've been to Washington a whole lot. I've been to the March for Life. Uh, this was twice the size of the largest March for Life that I've ever seen. I would uh, submit that maybe a million people were on the Mall that day. 
And since then, it, it, the, the numbers have waned. I expect this year to be pretty large, but I don't expect it to be as big as 2017. But as the years gone have gone on, the, the pro-abortion advocates have become more unruly, uh, more unrestrained. They're, they're really unhinged at this point, enraged over what's happening in Texas and what could potentially happen in the U.S. Supreme Court. And so, you know, we need to be girding our loins as pro-life advocates. Uh, if you're not experiencing persecution, if you're not experiencing pushback, you've got to wonder if you're doing the right thing. One thing at Created Equal, we're not afraid of going in uh, and crashing in on the gates of hell. We go where pro-aborts gather, where abortion advocates rally. That's where we go because we want to, not, want to let them know that there is opposition to what they're attempting to do. And so that's what we're going to be doing this Saturday across America, and we'll be doing it in Washington. Uh, Mr. Producer, if you would queue up, this is a video and actually sound of the Women's March in 2017. And I'll just say this. We were surrounded by hundreds of thousands of abortion advocates, and they were unhinged, in our face, screaming the entire time, it's one of the few times in my career in, a pro, in the pro-life movement that I was fearful for our staff and volunteers. I was afraid we weren't going to get out of there alive. Go ahead and play that clip. My husband decided I should. That was awful what your husband did. He did a terrible thing. You know what? It was a good idea. Was it? He forced you to get an abortion and that was a good idea? It is murder. It's not murder. I don't care. It's not murder. I don't care. I don't care. It's murder, murder. Why are you trying to cover his sign? Well, there you go. That's good enough. So my body, my choice. We heard that all day long. We're going to hear it this weekend at the Women's Marches across America. And I want to take a few minutes, the last remaining minutes, dealing with a couple of these euphemisms, arguments for abortion that the pro-abortion movement has been using for decades. Uh, the one is, and you heard it in the chant, my body, my choice, my body, my choice. We hear that all the time. And so what is the response to that as pro-life advocates? How do we respond to that chant or that argument? We hear it all the time, right? that abortion is a right, it's protected by the U.S. Constitution, and it's about a woman's right to choice, a right to her own body, my body, my choice. Well, first of all, let's think about this. Is abortion about their bodies or not? And I would submit to you, no, it's not. We're talking about a separate, unique human person inside, yes, it does. the baby does reside in the woman's body, but it's not her body. It's a separate body, a separate body that is alive, that is uniquely human and is whole and separate from the woman. Unless the woman has four arms, two heads and four legs, two hearts and all of that, it's not about her body. Now, the baby does reside in her body. And for that matter, she, uh, the, the child does reside in the body. So, so the environment may be different, but that does not give the right for the woman to kill that unborn child. The easiest way to deal with abortion arguments is simply compare the preborn to the born. On any argument for abortion, if you do that, their arguments make absolutely no sense. Because they would say, though, my body, my rights, my choice. Well, does that apply to born children too? Because we don't believe that women have the right to kill their born children, at least not yet, right? And why is that? Because they're born. We recognize them as human. The only difference between a born child and an unborn child is their size, their level of development, their environment, that is where they reside, and their dependency. And those things are completely arbitrary, and they're based on their age. Abortion is simply age-based discrimination. That's all it is. And so when you're arguing with someone or debating someone or having a conversation about abortion, remember, compare the pre-born to the born. No matter what the argument is, it will make no sense when you say to them, would you do that to a born child? And the answer is always no. And then you say, well, why is that? 
Well, because they're born. And then you say, well, what's the difference between a born child and an unborn child? And the, sim the answer is simply age. They're just younger. And we should not discriminate with against uh, individuals because they're younger. That's called ageism. Ageism. So it should have no bearing. Their environment or their location should have no bearing on who they are. If that were the case, I changed when I left my garage this morning and came to my office, to my studio. Just because I changed my location and environment, that had no bearing on whether I was a person and deserved rights of personhood. And so it is with the unborn. The unborn happened to reside in their mother's body for a reason, because they're younger. Where else could they reside? That's just how it works. That's the way human development works. And we wouldn't want to hold that against them and discriminate against them by killing them. So location does not decide personhood. The other thing is Roe versus Wade itself. You heard her say, uh, and many people will say, that women have the right to abortion, the constitutional right to abortion. Well, is that true? The answer is no. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that gives a right to a woman to kill her baby. Nothing. The word abortion doesn't appear. The word right to abortion or right to choose or freedom of choice, none of them approve, uh, 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 reside in the U.S. Constitution. The right to privacy, which is what the Roe v. Wade decision was based on, those words don't even actually appear in the Constitution. Now, we do agree and believe that People do have a, a, a right to privacy in some ways, right against illegal searches and seizures and this kind of thing. But that right to privacy does not extend to a woman killing her baby, right? But that's what the U.S. Supreme Court decided. The one thing they didn't decide was when life begins, when life begins. In fact, Associate Justice Harry Blackman, when he wrote the majority opinion in Roe v. Wade, said, quote, we need not decide the difficult question of life begins. Now, think about that. They are deciding whether abortion is going to be legal or decriminalized for hundreds of millions of Americans. Yet they didn't even take up the question of when life begins. But he went on to say that the word person, as it's used in the 14th Amendment, does not include the unborn. The 14th Amendment says that no state shall deprive any person of the right to life, liberty, uh, the, or property without due process. The right to life is inherent in our Declaration of Independence, and no one should be deprived of that right. The Supreme Court just decided out of thin air that the right to privacy, which they you know, it does not appear, extended to, the, to abortion, and they de redefined the word person to exclude the unborn. Out of thin air, they founded that right in what they called the penumbras of the Bill of Rights. And the penumbras are simply shadows or something that, that, that uh, exists to a greater or lesser degree. It's hard to discern. But they said that's where this right to abortion resides in the U.S. Constitution. It's in the penumbra. So we all know this, basically. Roe v. Wade was an exercise in raw judicial power. They legislated from the bench. And they took away the rights of states to to uh, protect the unborn and they gave it to themselves and they made it up. They made up the right to abortion in the Constitution. Abortion is not a constitutional right. It is simply a decision of Roe versus Wade. And the Roe decision was wrongly decided. And hopefully here this December, when they hear the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, they will overturn Roe versus Wade and return that issue where it belongs to the states, where we can go about banning abortion state by state and hopefully amending the Constitution by including a human life amendment, which will clarify that the word person in the 14th Amendment includes the unborn. Now, there is history. There are legal precedents to say that that word person does already include the unborn, but I think we need to uh, define it in a constitutional amendment so we don't have this changing uh, status of the unborn based on the whims, the political whims in the country and the changing of the guard on the U.S. Supreme Court. We just got to settle it once and for all, 
And so we, one huge step in that direction is overturning Roe versus Wade. So you've been listening to your radio activist here on the Mark Harrington Show. And as I said, folks, please follow us on Facebook, like our program, share it with people if you find merit in what we discussed today. And also, if you follow us by listening to our podcast, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, all the other popular podcasting platforms. So pray for us as we are in Washington, D.C. and across the country, uh, counter-protesting the Women's March. Uh, we'll see you next time. And, oh, by the way, we'll see you next time. But we have a Tuesday program. We're going to have the whistleblower on our program talking about vaccine mandates. This will be part four of the whistleblower. So tune in Tuesday at 1 p.m. on my social media platforms for a live broadcast. We'll see you next time. God bless you. God bless America. And remember America to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to make a difference for the cause of life, liberty, and justice, go to createdequal.org. To follow Mark, go to markharringtonshow.com. Be sure to tune in next time for your marching orders in the culture war.